communities are a major part of of the restoration project. So it's not just plants, but it's the people in those communities who are identifying locations to work with, they're identifying well, what are their, um, their goals in the, say, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, what do they want to see there in terms of a, a beautiful natural ecology in that space. But this is really about starting to take the conversation to working with people in communities, community members working with researchers and what other types of expertise that can be brought into a restoration project. So I'll ask uh, Des Ratama to come up and speak with us. Des um, is a, a long time um, resident from Whakatū um, and he's had a, um, a whole heap of experience in restoration and revegetation projects and has a whole lot of um, knowledge and experience to share with us this morning. Thank you Des. <laughs> Thank you, Mahani, for that wonderful introduction. You can't beat that. <laughs> Make me look like a chief even before I start. <clears throat> look, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here, Bruce, again in your presence and to hear the uh, tremendous knowledge that you share in terms of uh, restoration, in terms of our environment. I'm a member of our uh, Hawke's Bay Biodiversity Trust, recently uh, put together over the last seven or so years of discussion, consultation and now um, the fruits of all that work are now starting to show forth. <clears throat> so I stand here partly as that, partly as a, a community uh, of Whakatū and the work that we've been doing on the banks of our river Ngāri Dōro and the tremendous change that we've seen in the short time that we've been involved with that and also stand as, as a Māori uh, representative as well. I'm struck by the similarities of the environment and being a human being. Uh, if you go back to the beginning when my ancestors arrived and they found this beautiful land of Aotearoa, well taken care of by Papa Tūnuku and Rangirui, clothed and looking beautiful and bounteous for everybody. This discussion wouldn't have happened back then, <laughs> obviously. And then we go through this whole, um, this whole change of the landscape as the people change. And so as more people came on, land changed. As land changed, we made adjustments. And now we're at the stage now where we're starting to say, oh, we need to restore what it is our ancestors, collective term, our ancestors thought was right at their time in terms of turning this land into a land which then could sustain us, the future generations of this country. My own personal journey is similar to that. Three years ago, I stood at around 200 kgs 
and I and I was in very poor health. So you can take a an ecological uh, comparison there. In very poor health, I suffered from diabetes. I had heart trouble. I had movement trouble. I had breathing trouble. I suffered from anemia, and I would go into airplanes as a part of my business and, and, and actually call sphere in all of the passengers as I wobbled my way down the, the pathway and I would arrive at my seat and somebody would already be sitting there and I would say to them, you've won the draw. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just look at the absolute terror on their faces as this big guy sits down beside them and says, can you move over and read this? And then I have to shift in the side as the air host has been up and down the pathway. Three years ago, and I decided myself that that wasn't good enough. My doctor said to me, you don't change your day. And so the restoration of this body had to occur. <laughs> Thankfully, some people invested in me. Thankfully, some people said to me, we can help. Just like we're talking about with the land. So they invested financially in me. They allowed me to go away to walk and get bariatric surgery done. And three years later, I'm standing here in front of 90 kgs. My health is awesome. I have no longer have diabetes. I no longer sleep with a CPAP machine. I can drive and not go to sleep while I'm driving. I can talk to you with energy and enthusiasm. I can say to you, today I'm healthy. My surgeon has says to me, uh, when I was overweight, you need to have a heart operation because you got atrial fibrillation. And I said, what the heck's that? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I stand in front of you now, fitted out with a pacemaker, and my heart rhythm is steady. My blood pumps through my body, my fingertips which used to be cold and my toes which used to be cold are now warm. Take that comparison and put it into the biodiversity space that we're talking about. We started off with a pure body that became changed because of the impacts of a lot of things. Now we're at the stage where we need to restore that. The message of what I'm saying to you here today is it can happen. That's the important part. We can talk in long-term strategies, and you know, uh, with being Māori, it is about long-term strategies. Everything we do, we say, is for our mokopuna. Yeah. So it's never about us, it's never about today, it's always about tomorrow, and putting the long-term strategies in for tomorrow. Biodiversity, ecology, rich restoration, I know some new words that have been walking around with Bruce. Yeah, the environmental corridors, man, I'm hooked on that stuff. As we, as, we, as we start to undertake this restoration journey, how we start to fix Papa Tu and the Gua. So that her husband, Rangi Nui, doesn't cry, or, that he sees you, us, fix We have that mission. We destroyed it. We must fix it. My example to you about my own personal journey says it's possible. But more importantly, it's essential. My doctor says you're dead in three. Well, that's three years this time. So it can happen. I came back to, to my village of Whakatū after having served in the army for 30 years. Came back and saw a village that was destroyed by the closure of the freezing wings. Poverty reigned in a community that once was wealthy. With jobs were plenty. As a young boy, I would have three jobs. Coming back to it, there's no jobs. Coming back to the suicide, drug and alcohol, mortgage sales, divorces, violence. Freezing works closed. Community destroyed. Worse than that, I go and have a look at my river. And it's polluted. Green algae and slime suffocated Papa Thunaku. And the river called Nadin Dora Mokutu, a little king up there. Suffocated. It needed to change. So I set about with my community to change it. To engage in conversation with regional council, district council, everybody else who had a role to play in the restoration of my river. Come down with me now and I'll show you. In fact, I put up on Facebook just two weeks ago. The riparian planting we've done on the, on the riverbanks of Ngāru from Clive back up to Whakatū on both sides of Kōpātiki and our side. In my view, and I'm laying claim and ownership to it, the slime and the green stuff, the weeds on our river are gone. 
five years. What gave me encouragement for that was a story I heard about Raglan and restoration up in the harbour of Raglan and how all the, the pippies and the biovalve species up there were being suffocated by silt. And with the planting of riparian plantings, not only down on the front but up into the farmlands, over the years restored back that biodiversity to that harbour. So that gave me the encouragement to engage us on the community level. Convincing our community to do it was a difficult part. Because a lot of the generation that's in Whakatū now didn't grow up with the river as a part of their playground. That was my playground, that was our playground, of our, our age group. I used to boast in the old days that I could walk the length of my river without touching the ground. From tree to tree to tree to tree. And somebody decided those trees weren't the best trees for our river. So they took them out. The shade cover that protected the spawning grounds of our eels and of our white boat would change. The temperature of the water heated up. The nutrient rich flows in their water gave rise to the algae and to the weed. And because they also changed the direction of the river, the flow changed. So silt now settled on the beds of this river, which once was gravel. So all those changes occurred, but I'm standing before you today to say to you, come with me and let's have a look at the river today. Not only just enjoy the, the fruits of all the plantings of many hens on the banks of that river, but now start to see the bird life that's coming back onto our waters. We used to have green bait, not white bait. And the fishermen would pull out these bucket loads of green bait, would still eat them. This is the way you get rid of the green bait, you just put them in fresh water so they blow up. Then you eat what's left. Well, the green stuff would come out and then you can eat what's left. Now it's white bait. Right? White bait is back in our river. That's five, six years of effort of change. You know, I listened to, on the radio this morning, and I was talking about the, the Prince Harry and uh, his gorgeous wife enjoying their time in our country. And she finished. What's her name? Megan. Megan. <laughs> you guys are <laughs> Megan finished off by saying just how grateful she was, and she gave this quote from Catherine Manfield. Anybody hear it? This one on the radio? It says, When it rains and nourishes the soil, remember it's made up of many drops. I thought, what an outstanding comment to be making, and for her to be making, and how it fits in with what we're talking about in terms of biodiversity and ecological restoration. I'm sure she didn't make that connection, but it made that connection for me. Everything we do is made up of the little drops. Here in this room are a whole lot of little drops that together will nourish the environment that we all, we all, to bring back. I remember the stories of saving the snails down Southland as opposed to having jobs and, and coal miners being able to do their stuff and I just kill the snails. Who cares? The frogs, get rid of the frogs. It's more important that we have jobs, more important that people can survive. I need to realise that that is a part of what's required to survive. A rich environment, a healthy environment, replicates itself directly onto the inhabitants of that environment. There is no doubt in my mind that this and this go hand in glove. So when we say partnering with mana whenua, what does that mean to people in this room? Anybody got a response to that? Partnering with mana whenua. I had difficulty understanding that myself. So I'm not surprised no hands gone up. <laughs> Partnering is a good concept, yeah, it means uh, there's friends, we can work together. Mana whenua, that concept gets used often in the context of you need to talk to mana whenua before, you need to consult with mana whenua before. Then that's normally followed by who are mana whenua? Yeah? And there's a whole area of confusion around who are mana whenua. Even I'm confused by who are mana whenua. Right, because the concept of mana is this. 
having the ability to control what happens on your land gives you the right to hold mana over your whenua. So the confusion is today, does that still exist? Do Māori still have mana whenua? And the answer is, no, they don't. Because you've gone and bought a piece of land. And now the mana of that land is with you. You get to control what happens on that quarter acre section, or whatever else there is. So the concept of mana whenua becomes a bit of a, uh, a dogma, as in today's environment we try to understand it. But if you go back to the genesis of mana whenua, when my ancestors were battling each other to say, this river to that mountain, that's mine, and it's mine because I can hold it. It's mine because I can repel you when you try and take it off me. And in that concept today, we use that, and we use the history of that time, to try and determine what treaty settlements should look like. And then determine what sort of compensation should go against what that looks like. What we haven't done is vary this stuff up, what Bruce is bringing, to what Māori can bring. Question. When Captain Cook came to New Zealand, he circumnavigated the islands thinking what? Do you know the answer to this question? You got this is your son's session, not mine. But when he circumnavigated New Zealand, he thought North Island, South Island, one big island. Yeah? Until he got there and Cook straight. Determined that actually there's a passageway through here. So maybe they're not joined. My ancestors came down to this country and they determined from the outset because they named it like that. What's the mighty name for the South Island? Do we know? Waipo Namu. Waipo Namu, yeah, or? I heard somebody say the Waka. Uh, Sorry? Takatumu. Well, no, that's good. Takatumu is the idea we're telling to give it back to. <laughs> But the mighty name for this white Nomi, but it also is the Waka Maori. Yeah. Huh? And the name for the North Island is? Te Iko Maori. Captain Cook didn't know that. <laughs> right? My ancestors were here way before he arrived and already knew that the North Island was in the shape of a fish. How do I know that? Well, of course, the, the, the top end of the fish is caught at, at where the North Island is, right up there where. Uh, where the oceans meet, is called? Diana. Yeah, that's the place. But the name is Te Hiku o Te Ika. Te Hiku o Te Ika is the tail of the fish. Hmm, go down to Wellington. Wellington is called? Upoko. Upoko o Te Ika. The head of the fish. Hawke's Bay is called? Matau. Matau. Uh, Maui. The fish hook of Maui. Up in Wairo, there's a mountain there called Whakapuanake. Whakapuanake is the area where the hook pierced the fish and the fish was pulled out of the ocean. Those are our stories, which when Captain Cook came to this country, knew nothing about and tried to then give his names to the things he saw. So how did my ancestors know that the North Island was in the shape of a fish? Other than being very intelligent and very smart, how did they know? And it's a very good question. How did they navigate across the oceans without sextants and compass, without log charts? It's a very good question. When we talk about Papa Tūnuku and Ranginui, when we talk about all the children, as my wife said, in that wire, they compose it. We personify everything that exists in the world. We make them like us. So you can't cut a tree there unless you have a cut it here. And you think, you think Tane Mahuta, you think Papa and Rangi for the gift of this tree. You can't just chop it down because that is like you, that is a person. You can't go into the ocean and harvest all the fish from the ocean without giving thanks to Tangaro for the gifts of his children to us because we're personified. And in that personification, we have put into there a control. Um, an ability to ensure 
that we don't destroy. Because it's like destroying your own family. And in that way, our controls on our environment were then put in place. We had regional councils. We had government legislation. Oh yeah, there was an old battle. Over here at, at Whakatū, there was a battle there called Pakiaka. Pakiaka was the battle of the Kahikatea trees. The Kahikatea trees grew strong and proud on the banks of the river. So big. It's so plentiful that it was called big bush, little bush in English skills. And from the mountain, Mataruha over here, Bluff Hill today called, you could look south and you could see big bush, little bush, which went from Whakatū all the way up to Havelock North. Kahinga Tia Fars. They look for them today, they're not there. Right. And so, the point is this. Somewhere we lost the connection between the personification of everything that exists and our own existence. They became things that we used to ensure that we benefit. The word kaitiaki. Kaitiaki referred to use this morning. The word kaitiaki to <coughs> means guardianship. Cool. Caretaker. Does it mean owner? No, Good. Because <laughs> it doesn't mean owner. Kaitiaki is about, I own nothing, but I have the responsibility of everything. The concept is so completely different to one of owning. And the concept of kaitiaki tanga against ownership is so at odds with each other. The casualty of that is our environment. While we might, we being my ancestors, might say we've got this rule of how we would coexist with our environment, as opposed to how we'd use our environment so I can coexist. Completely different ideology. <laughs> we, we end up with this concept which has been asked to talk about partnering with Manafim. Today, if we understand what I said about mana whenua as the concept in today, and the dilemma that many people have of identifying who mana whenua might be, and even within Māori family, there is this constant tussle about who mana whenua are. It's a lovely battle. <laughs> we have it often on what eyes around the country. Look at Ngāpui up at the north. Nobody from Ngāpui is going to shoot me down. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even sign their treaty agreement up there, and they're having some real robust discussions amongst themselves. We've got our own down here with Tamata people and building the track up the side and we've got this own whawhai happening down here. We're having robust discussions. Right? If one party says another party, but I'm on the whenua, no, no, I'm on the whenua, well, I will on the whenua. So even we get confused with the concept of on the But the purpose of on the is very important. Not so much who they are, but the purpose the concept of Manafina. Because that helps provide the balance to the changes that happen. I've had people come to me look, up here on, on Chuti Okura. They wanted to put windmills up there. I don't know what they call it. Wind power turbines up on there. Yeah? And so our answer, my, uh, some of my uh, chiefs from around here said, I to buy, put them up there. Paikia uh, Kaichiaki comes and sees in fact, he says they're going to build these wind power turbines on the top of Tutiokura. I go, oh, who said that? He says, oh, they've talked to the chiefs over in Navy and they all said it's okay. Which chiefs did they talk to? And I said to Max, he says, those aren't my mountains, so I can't say anything else going to happen. He said, no, but you will be affected by the vista. No, oh, that's fair enough. So I go over and I talk to my wife's uncles. And I say to my wife's uncles, Oh, you've agreed. Yep. Why do you think that? He says, they took me down to Woodville. And in Woodville, they already got these turbines up. And I went up there and I stood beside them, and there was this, as, uh, as the propellers went around, they go, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And he says, you know, boy, that reminded me of the mutton birds 
Long Ahari is the name. That when the mutton birds took flight, that was their sound. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. And he just said, I thought that was great. The mutton birds have come back. <laughs> <laughs> I said to my uncle, can't fight. But you also tell me the story about the wearing of Papa Rangi, Papa Merangi. You tell us on the one eye all the time about the separation of Rangi and Papa by her son Tan. And how that separation was very traumatic for our parents. And that some some places the skin didn't come apart. And that they actually go through and cut the skin. And that skin was the mountain tops. You tell us this on. And he's sitting there listening to me, he goes, yes. So, so you tell me this, now you're saying, you're telling me in the context that there's blood there, it's been spilt, it's chocolate, therefore we should leave them alone. Now you're saying, put these poles up there. He says, well, oh, good point. So he got a hold of me, and he says, I've changed my mind. I do not agree to the windmills going on the hill. To this day, there are no windmills on the hill. It's not because I'm a powerful talker to him. It's that I see it to him, this is what you teach us. So in terms of the environment, in terms of the environment, what my ancestors have taught me about the environment, I hold precious. And I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely keen to share. So we all understand the same thing from the same point of view. You want to partner with Mana, with Māori or Mana Fena, here's how you do it. It's pretty simple, really. You turn up like that. <laughs> Not white. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> you turn up with a blank piece of paper and you say, we need to have a conversation. You don't turn up like this and say, I've got a conversation that I want you to hear. Right? See the difference in that concept? No reason why this should be any different. While we have the advantages today of the researchers, the job, while we have the advantage today of passionate people like Bruce bringing to us the wonderful scientific background knowledge, we also have a huge repository of cultural knowledge that needs to be brought together. That's the part that we should concentrate on how we make that happen. So when we launched the Biodiversity Trust at the mission um, a month ago, Mana Whenua sat on the fire. It's quite funny really because I'm sitting next door to him. Uh, Bill Prentice was his name if anybody knows Bill. He's uh, the head of uh, Mana OD Incorporated, which my wife is a member of. And so we're doing this as well. We're coming for the, um, the Minister of Conservation, Eugenie Sage. Comes in and we do the talks. <coughs> no, I said to him, Matua, thank you for coming. Thank you for blessing our conference with the presence of Mother Fina. He goes, well, I only come because I thought you were the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not the chairman. That guy's the chairman over there. I'm the two IC to the chairman. Oh, well, we need to change that. I said, no, I'm quite happy because Charles is the guy that's the chairman, uh, Charles Dowdy, and he's, he's a scientist, he's a good colleague of Bruce's, and he's a guy who's got an immense knowledge in the space, and I've got an immense knowledge in my space, and we are working very well together in sharing that knowledge and connecting it up. So we're starting it our way to bring these two packages of knowledge together, partnering with Mana Whenua. Yeah? And you're all going to have examples in your own spaces, how you work in your communities, with the Māori people. Uh, so the question might be more of partnering with Māori whenua, partnering with Māori. Yeah, because more and more, Māori are just as transportable as everybody else. I'm here, born up, born in Hawke's Bay, because my dad's from here. But my mum is from Rungafakata, which is in Gisborne. She came down here, met this good looking guy who's my dad, and I'm an exact replica of him. <laughs> <laughs> Married him, had seven sons to my dad, and we stay here. But my mum was always wrong for her. 
So when she tried to do things with Kaimi and the people, it was very difficult for her. Because Kaimi and the people weren't all that accepting of people because there was already enough Kaimi and the people around. And it was actually a sad thing from our side. The point is that in, in, in answering the question, partly we the to the question might be better put by how do we work with Māori, how does Māori work with everybody else? So in our community of Whakatū, that's not a question. The question is, the village, we've got work to do, and the village comes. One, because regional council turn up with a barbecue, which is always good, <laughs> and plants, and hole diggers. So we go around and put the plants in the hole and cover them up and say, job done, what's for dinner? <laughs> But the difference, the transformation on our riverbanks because of that effort, because of that inclusion, because of that partnering within the community, people, as a community, to regional council, Hastings District Council, other, other groups, planting groups that come out to the call to plant in the riverbanks. And so, partnering in that concept, in a lot of ways, is already taking place. We're going to run into the question though of, for example, the airport and the estuary that's now out, the Ahujuri estuary, Pandora Pond, all of that very strong Manafena presence because as a part of their treaty of settlement, all that land has been given back to Manafena. Now, so now there's a, and I'm always back, here's this partnering responsibility that has to occur. Because if you go there to the airport now and you see the new road, watching this road that goes through now, and you see those seagulls. I thought they were gannets. <laughs> but okay, they're seagulls. Or birds. Actually, I might be wrong with seagulls too, but do you know what they are? Okay. Gods. <laughs> God with. Okay. So, but what, no, the point is that already it's starting to look beautiful. As you now go on the new road into the airport, and it's going to improve and develop further. There is a need for a partnership between the group that is, is defined as the Manafena because of the treaty settlements, who've had the land returned to them, and the airport, and dock, and regional council. So there is a need to partner. See, the aspirations of our people, and I can talk generally about this because we talk about it all the time. The aspiration is to return and to restore to the way it used to be. During today, well, that's going to be a challenge to the how it used to be stage. Now, when we're doing the plans in the riverbank, I wanted a carpet, just like this pink carpet that's out here, the cherry blossoms. Beautiful. Not too sure how indigenous they are, but beautiful. <laughs> and I wanted this beautiful carpet along our, our length of riverbank from Clyde through the other end of Whakatū of Kōkai flowers and Pahutakawa flowers on the floor of the cycle way as you cycled your way through my village. I need to be told, yes to Kōkai, no to Pahutakawa. <laughs> I want Pahutakawa. <laughs> and the advice I got from this very knowledgeable guy Pūtikāwas don't come from you now, just like Bruce was saying. Grow what grows, and Pūtikāwas don't grow. Well, man, that was a major letdown to my carpet of red and gold. <laughs> so instead I'm going to plant daffodils in the park and have more gold. <laughs> it gives another carpet to the park. The point is, going back to what's been said already, you must, in turning and restoring back to the way it used to be, have those that used to be there, as a part of that used to be. Don't do this rather than say, when Pooja Carvels were Pooja Carvels, never were. Right. And so, you come along there, now you can't help but see it when you drive between Hastings and Clive, turn to your right and you're going towards Hastings, and you see the bank has got this um, growth from the little fellas up to the big fellas. We haven't got the trees yet. We started planting Kahakatea down at the southern end of the river, closest to the railway liners, in the hope that they take and grow. My understanding about Kākatīas is that they are not only enjoy wet feet, but they're very family-oriented tree. They grow better when they've got the relations around them. 
tell me a family that doesn't do the same thing. And we grow better with our brothers and sisters around us. Most of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so there's a lot of parallels, as I said, from the outset that can be given to our own progress. Growing up as a healthy young guy in Whakatū, being impacted as I grew up uh, by many, many things. Education, food, environment, employment. Coming back to Whakatū 60 years later, 200 kgs, overweight, obese, unwell, three years ago, ahead of me, and saying, I need to be restored. I need to have a, a body restoration take place. And use that as an example to say it's achievable on this side of the work we've done in the faculty to say it's being achieved and to have a lot of hope. That's why I'm hooked into this biodiversity corridors, environmental corridors that Bruce talks about so Well, he showed this that look, Bruce is the only guy that can make charts and graphics look exciting. <laughs> <laughs> when he presented that Havelock North, I'm going, shh, charts. Your question over here. Yeah, how smart you have to be with Massey in my question too. So I'm looking at this and going, oh, I'm going to be asleep shortly. But he put that whole stuff to life and hooked me in. And even worse, I didn't understand what he was saying. You know? And fell in love with the passion that he brought. And the environmental corridors I've got. So our, our last discussion at the Biodiversity uh, Trust uh, meeting, I put on the table, our first project should be these corals. And the reason for that is because cycleways already exist. So we can start planting the cycleways. Then if you've been up in the plain and uh, you take off at a Napier and you have a look down at the window, you go window seat and you've got a big fat guy sitting next door to you, <laughs> you can have a look at, uh, at the window and you can see all these cycle tracks. White scars in the land and no vegetation alongside them. Whoa, make great environmental corridors, is my thinking. Oh, I see Bruce nodding. Yeah. Yes, good. <laughs> the work's already been done. It's a government initiative. So always. So let's plant them. Let's get busy using the information we got here, using my cultural understanding and passion about Papa Tua and the and let's start to own that through the cycle tracks. Because permission's already been granted for those type of tricks to go across the land and plant. It just seems to be to be a no-brainer. No-brainer. Are there plants available? Yeah, now Fino Rahu got plenty of plants. Regional Council, they got plenty of plants. A lot of nurseries that contribute. Anybody have nurseries in here? Yeah, I'm nursing, sort of yeah. I've got one through Jaggy. <laughs> but yet yeah, there's a lot of nurseries around that contribute their shrubs and trees in that to this project. Partnering with Manafin or partnering with Māori is simple. Come to me with a blank piece of paper and let's co-design the way forward. Let's partner, let's work together. Not for my children or your children, but for our children. Now, I'm doing this study on the side of that ageing world in New Zealand. And 10 years from now, we're going to have more older people than younger people. People aren't having as many babies as my mum and dad used to have. So we're going to end up 30 or 40 years from now with a very poor younger generation coming through. Maybe the top cover is too dense. Maybe there's too many people living longer and therefore killing out the growth as they come through. Maybe we need to start doing a bit of uh, clearing out of the older generation, but as, as, they get old, as they get older, and I'm entering into that space so I can talk a bit of knowledge about it, uh, you're living longer. And even better, you're living healthier longer. Yeah? And so the dynamics are going to change. Not my words, researchers words. Not this particular researcher, <laughs> generally researchers words. Yeah, that sees these things to us. So there's a lot of things. Climate change, yeah, yeah, that's a biggie, but I take on board what Bruce is saying. Our plants are more adaptable than we are. And they spend a long time doing it than we have. We just got to get out of the road sometimes. Let nature do what it needs to do and does well. All right, clear it <laughs> Just get on and let them do what they need to do. And Papa Tuna can do her job. But we have to give her a hand because we destroy them. Yeah. My river now flows 
And I, I saw on your chart up here, I believe some one of your second to last slides, I think, you had the river, then it wasn't actually your picture, but you took ownership of it. <laughs> In that river, it looked like there was a, a waterfall or something. Yeah? Are you advocating that? What we've done is we've got, we've got these very sterile waterways, you know, which don't do the job that it should be doing. The meandering stream is the way it should have gone. Rocks and boulders in the streams. Of, well, no, people are going to take them out because it's a flood then, you know. Too many rocks build up, flood, people eat floods. That event happened, yeah, it can't be much. But for the rest of the time, you've got a beautiful river that's taking care of its own health. We've got beaches that don't have sand on them anymore. We're sure, home on a teal on it. Those beaches which we as kids would go down and play on all the weekends. Used to be beautiful Hawaii type beaches. Go to them now and see what you see. And my view is all the building material for those is up on the rivers still. Because we've changed the flow of the rivers. We're not allowing on that building material to get to where it's needed. People say, oh, the tides have changed, the currents have changed. Maybe as well. What I do know is we used to have beautiful Hawaii type beaches, and today we don't. What I do know is I go into my river, I go to knee deep in silt which was never there as young guy when I would walk on the shingle on the floor of my river. So there's a lot of things there that we can partner up and change. The message of today as I close off now is to say to you, it's important that we partner, it's important that we understand each other's contribution, it's important that we co-design the way forward. But it's absolutely essential you start. Now. Start now. Ah. We're not to walk a boat to walk it. Oh, and I get my need to come up and sing the environmental song that was written by Fitu Tariha. Uh, not, um, what's Fitu's name? Two of you are anyway, uh, involved with uh, plant conservation. Fiji's now passed away, but they've left this wonderful song, which you now embrace. <coughs> ah.